Dropping those beats. Hey everyone, things are feeling depressing just about everywhere right now. So not only are you in luck as your favorite YouTube show full of hopiums here to take the doom pill away, but it's also important to remember that there are causes just outside your door that you could get involved in too. Whether it be a trade union at your job, a tenant union in your apartment building, or a mutual aid group right around the corner. Getting involved in activism on the ground really helped my mental health and optimism for the future, and I can absolutely guarantee it'll help yours too. Who knows? You could be on the show in the future doing something incredible. Anyway, without further ado, let's hear some incredible, positive, leftist news. Members of the Nagati Maniapoto Iwi erupted into song and haka as New Zealand's House of Representatives unanimously voted to pass the Maniapoto Claims Settlement Bill into law. The Waikato-based tribe of nearly 46,000 members received 177 million New Zealand dollars in financial redress, the country's fifth largest sum of its kind, along with the return of 36 sites of cultural significance and an apology over colonial atrocities. Hundreds of Maniapoto Iwi members traveled for nine hours to reach Wellington, where they joined many more members in the Parliament's public gallery to witness the vote. Fantastic news, and as Associate Minister of Maori Development Nanaina Mahuta stressed, this is not about compensation, this is redress. Land back everywhere. For 60,000 years, Australia's indigenous peoples have been in a relationship with and cared for their ancestral land. Now, more than 220 years after they were forcibly removed by British colonizers, two states, Western Australia and Queensland, have returned more than 3,700 square miles of land to native Australians. This move is part of a push to create and preserve more national parks and find ways to make amends for the nation's brutal colonial history. The new parks will be indigenous-led, but still co-managed with the state using both traditional Aboriginal knowledge and sustainable modern practices. Indigenous leaders say this increased control of their territories represents crucial progress. Tyron Garstone, an indigenous representative of Kimberley Land Council said, the creation of these marine parks is a significant milestone for Australia as it shows true co-design between government and traditional owners can be achieved. The US Department of Interior has officially removed 28 Native American slurs that were formerly names for geographical features in Colorado. This is part of an ongoing push to remove 650 slurs in the country and remove one racist and misogynist term in particular from federal use. Since 2021, Interior Secretary Deb Haaland has established processes to remove this word from the names of geographical features like waterways, mountains, and valleys. Haaland said in a statement, I feel a deep obligation to use my platform to ensure that our public lands and waters are accessible and welcoming. That starts with removing racist and derogatory names that have graced federal locations for far too long. Hundreds of tech employees have been protesting against Google and Amazon signing a deal with the Israeli government to develop artificial intelligence tools under the so-called Nimbus project, which will be used to trace and control Palestinian movements. The movement is called No Tech for Apartheid and is pushing back against big tech companies' disregard for ethical standards and their growing complicity with the Israeli occupation of Palestinian territories. A joint statement issued by over 1,000 Google and Amazon employees movement website asserts that technology should be used to bring people together, not enable apartheid, ethnic cleansing, and settler colonialism. Apoorva Gautam, South Asia and Asia-Pacific coordinator of the Palestinian BDS movement, says that, apart from defending Palestinian human rights, this campaign also stands with struggles against digital colonialism and militarization of our societies through technology. Fantastic to see this growing opposition movement within the tech industry. This story is truly remarkable. Workers at the Canary newspaper in the UK unionized with the IWW, but they didn't stop there. Acting in solidarity, they initiated what they call a workers' revolution, seizing control of their workplace, kicking out the bosses, and registering a new worker cooperative. In a statement, they write, This means that all decisions will be made by the workers from now on. There will be no bosses, and everyone will get paid the same for a day's work. 
We aim to be an example of radical democracy in action. If we want to see revolutionary change in society, we first need to take back control of our lives, our livelihoods, and our workplaces to create an infrastructure that can be a resource for movements struggling for change. We hope the Canary can play an important role in providing a platform for a radical politics that seeks to transform society in a holistic way, not just to elect a social democratic leader while leaving the rotten state system in place. Major solidarity with these visionary workers. Workers are organizing in several different countries against rampant and unjust inflation. We start in Tunisia, where hundreds of people took to the streets of the capital, Tunis, on September 25th, protesting against the rise of the cost of essential commodities and President Kais Saeed's inability to tackle their long-term economic crisis. The protesters carried loaves of bread and shouted slogans such as, where is sugar? And we can't support crazy price rises. They called for improvements in living conditions and jobs, freedom, and national dignity. Meanwhile, opposition parties have announced the boycott of the upcoming legislative elections in December. The Democratic current party issued a formal statement denouncing President Saeed's denial about the deteriorating living conditions of Tunisians. It warned that the government's failure to take measures to provide their most basic subsistence needs could lead to an unprecedented social disaster. And Amar Amruzia, a member of the Central Committee of the Workers' Party, has made a plea to the people of Tunisia to unite to fight for their social and economic rights. Moving to Europe on September 30th, the Workers' Party of Belgium, or PTB, launched weekly protests called Fridays of Rage, Vendredi de la Colère against the government's failure to tackle the ongoing cost of living crisis. Protests were held on Friday in several cities with the call to bring down the prices of food, energy, and other essentials. The protesters also demanded that the government tax the energy multinational that they say is benefiting from the crisis. Protests have been held throughout the month of October. PTB's Tony Bousselin said that against this government that is complicit with the energy multinationals, we are not standing idly by. This mobilization is a first step of a large movement. Each week there will be Fridays of anger in different cities. The trade unions will also be in action, including a general strike on November 9th. They can count on the support of the PTB. Solidarity with Belgian workers. Workers in Greece are also planning a general strike on November 9th to demand increases in wages and pensions, collective agreements, and concrete measures to tackle the cost of living crisis. Over this past month, working class sections across Greece have intensified protests against the termination of jobs and the persecution of workers by employers and the state. The All Workers Militant Front has demanded the government increase the minimum wage to €825 Euros per month in the private sector, along with a 20% increase in the public sector, and has laid out an 11-point plan to address the cost of living crisis. PLN will watch as this story unfolds next month. British trade unions and leftist organizations have been mobilizing to demand better working and living conditions. Called by the Enough is Enough campaign, protests began on Saturday the 1st of October when over 100,000 people from over 50 cities across England came together to rally against the Conservative government for failing to tackle the ongoing cost of living crisis. The next day, trade unions and left-wing sections joined a protest demonstration called People's Assembly Against Austerity in solidarity with postal and rail workers who were on strike against poor pay and work conditions. All major trade unions across the nation, including the Communist Party of Britain and the National Union of Rail, expressed solidarity with the protests and participated in the mobilizations. The Enough is Enough campaign is demanding 1. A significant pay rise 2. A reduction of energy bills 3. An end to food poverty 4. Decent and affordable homes for all and 5. Taxing the rich Labour Party MP Jeremy Corbyn expressed support for the protests in a statement that read, Up and down the country, workers and communities are fighting back against greed, inequality and exploitation. As wages fall while profits soar, our message is clear. We are not here to manage. We are not here to broker. We are here to win. F yeah, I didn't know he said that. That rocks. F I love that. On September 29th, workers across 200 locations in France mobilized to demand improvements in living conditions. French workers have been protesting the austerity-driven neoliberal policies of Emmanuel Macron for the past four years. This most recent protest came from trade unions, including the General Confederation of Labour, Solidaires, and youth and student groups like the Young Communist Movement of France, MJCF, Union of Communist Students, 
and others. Workers are demanding a raise in wages, pensions, and purchasing power, a reduction in the VAT on fuel, an extra tax on the excess profit made by private energy companies, and to shut down a recent proposal to increase the age of retirement from 62 to 65. And in the Netherlands, the Socialist Party is demanding effective measures from the government to address the increasingly unlivable cost of living crisis. On September 17th, SP organized a large demonstration in Hague under the banner, enough is enough, lower the energy bill and grab the corporate profits. These protests proved to be a success as Mark Rutte's centre-right government is considering a cap on energy prices. And on September 23rd in the House of Representatives, Socialist leader Lillian Marinesen has called for the lowering of energy prices, the nationalization of the energy sector, the increase of minimum wages and taxation of corporate profits. To tackle some of these issues, SP proposed an emergency plan which includes increasing the hourly minimum wage to 15 euros, freezing rents, ensuring affordable healthcare and groceries, and decreasing the tax on fuel. As the crisis in Europe deepens, workers across several states are uniting and saying no more. All power to the people. Haitians have been mobilizing in protest against the threat of foreign military intervention in the nation. After de facto far-right leader Ariel Henry asked the international community to send armed support to resolve gang violence, hundreds of thousands of Haitians took to the streets across the nation under the banner of Down with Ariel Henry, Down with the Foreign Occupation. In the capital, Port-au-Prince, thousands of citizens gathered and marched demanding Henri's unconditional resignation and an end to all kinds of foreign interference in the country. Protesters raised slogans such as, The United States is the problem. It cannot be the solution. These mobilizations were part of a week-long protest organized by various civil society organizations, trade unions, and left-wing opposition parties against the US-backed Henri administration. During his illegitimate leadership, economic, political, and social crises in the country have skyrocketed. The Haitian people seek to defend their sovereignty, disallow imperialist forces to occupy their nation, and will themselves find resolutions to their struggles. Reynold Sanon, coordinator of Radio Resistance and Haitian Popular Press Agency, stated that foreign intervention insults our ancestors who fought to break the chains of slavery. He assures that in the case that the foreign military occupation force arrived in Haiti, all Haitians, progressive groups, popular organizations, and left-wing political parties will stand to fight. The Michigan Nurses Association, University of Michigan Professional Nurse Council at the University of Michigan won a path-breaking contract for better working conditions. The pandemic pushed University of Michigan nurses to a breaking point, as supervisors forced often uncompensated overtime work in response to understaffing. Overtime work switched from voluntary to mandatory, and nurses who declined mandates could be accused of patient abandonment. As one nurse, Renee Curtis, states, they made millions on the backs of nurses working harder and harder. And nurses got to the point where we couldn't do it anymore. Nurses said enough is enough. And on October 1st, following six months of negotiations, the nurses union won a groundbreaking contract that incentivizes rather than mandates overtime work, enforcing staffing ratios and includes retention and ratification bonuses and a 22.5% wage increase over the four years of the contract. Overall, this contract shifts the burden to hospitals as opposed to nurses to resolve understaffing issues. Issues. The nurses hope that their contract will inspire hospital workers across the nation. Nurse union member Ann Jackson states, If you listen to the frontline nurses, patients are safer. The reason I'm in my union is because it gives me a strong voice at the bedside of my patient that allows me to advocate for their safety with my union behind my back. Congratulations to Michigan nurses! Workers at Vancouver game developer Anemone Hug Interactive have voted to unionize, which marks the first full-service game development studio to form a union in Canada. The workers are now members of the Canadian Animation Guild IATSE Local 938. John Lewis, IATSE International VP and Director of Canadian Affairs, said, For years, game workers in Canada have been working without the benefits and protections of a union collective agreement and without the strength of union representation. Today, a clear message has been sent to game workers in every province. Forming a union is not only possible, it has been done. Hell yeah, love that one. After 19 days of striking, the workers at the Philadelphia Museum of Art reached an agreement with their employer. They state, There were five issues going into the strike. We got all five management claimed they couldn't move. They did. 
Say it with us. United we fight, united we win. Congratulations to the workers. And on October 20th, residents of Hume, Manchester, UK, crossed another hurdle in their campaign to stop an 11 story student accommodation block being built when the planning committee voted to reject the proposals. The accommodations have been planned since 2020 to be built on the site of a former pub called the Gamecock, but residents in the neighborhood have said they're absolutely not up for new needless gentrification. The apartment building would have been one of the many new developments in Greater Manchester that students are already unable to afford due to skyrocketing rents because of landlords who simply do not care about providing affordable housing to local working class people and simply want to exploit people for as much money as they can. Now that the development has been halted, they're working on moving forward their alternative vision for the site, which has the opportunity to be so much more than just another lifeless block of unaffordable flats. In fantastic news, the US Army fell short of its 2022 recruiting goal by a full 25%. Other branches of the military, including Marines, Air Force and Navy all met their goals, but are behind recruiting totals compared to previous years. The Marines typically start out each fiscal year with 50% of the New Year's recruiting total already met. They're currently only at 30%. Other branches have significantly lower numbers. Military recruiters have cited private companies offering student loan tuition relief and COVID preventing them from accessing teenagers and young adults in schools as two driving factors of low recruiting numbers. How predatory. GOP Congressman Representative Jim Banks, Republican Independent, went as far as to openly state that Biden's student loan relief plan could hurt military recruiting. There you have it, folks. Saying the quiet part right out loud. Late last month, the governments of Colombia and Venezuela officially reopened their common land border following seven years of closure. In a ceremony held on the Simón Bolívar Bridge, the first cargo trucks filled with goods were exchanged one from Venezuela, the other from Colombia, marking the resumption of trade and the strengthening of relations between the two countries. Dozens of people from both borders joyfully celebrated reopening of the border, shouting, Viva Colombia! Viva Venezuela! Viva Bolivar! President Petro from the border said that the re-establishment of relations between the two nations would benefit the economies of the border cities. Today is a historic day for the country, for the region, for South America and America in general. I want the first people who benefit to be those who live on either side of the border, those who took risks on the trails crossing the border. On September 26th, thousands of incarcerated workers in the Alabama prison system began a massive strike to protest against brutal conditions, racist sentencing, and essentially what amounts to slave labor. According to the two groups that organized the strike, Free Alabama Movement and Both Sides of the Wall, about 80% of the people in Alabama prisons are on strike, which is 20,000 of the 25,000 total prisoners. In breaking with the usual denial of political action by prisoners, the Alabama Department of Corrections admitted there was a work stoppage in most of the prisons. In response, prison authorities have cut food to cold meals and brought in work release prisoners from the outside, forcing them to do food preparation. The state is also mounting riot squads to violently quell the strikers. In spite of the fact that work strikes have accounted for the most peaceful periods in the history of Alabama's often troubled prisons. Strikers listed nine demands, including the immediate repeal of the habitual offender law, which punishes those who have three felony convictions, even if one or more are decades old, or are for non-violent offenses with life in prison without parole. Of those punished with this abhorrent and inhuman penalty in Alabama, 75% are black people. Other demands include mandatory parole criteria, a streamlined process for medical furloughs, and review of elderly incarcerated individuals for immediate release, and a return to earned good time credit for all sentences. In 2020, the US Department of Justice sued the state of Alabama, alleging that conditions in men's prisons violate the constitution because of a failure to protect men from violence, sexual abuse, excessive use of force by staff, and failure to maintain safe conditions. The report found that Alabama's major prisons were at 182% of capacity. All power to the strikers in their battle against this obscene system. This month in Mexico City, the Unidad de Salud Integral para Personas Trans, or Unit for Integral Healthcare for Trans People, celebrated its first anniversary. 
Throughout a week-long celebration, they gave informative talks and workshops. The services in this unit are exceptional in the country because they provide medical care, from mental health counseling to hormone replacement therapy to trans people for free. The clinic is also staffed primarily by trans people. Hopefully, this is just the first of many anniversary celebrations to come. In these next two stories out of India, the Supreme Court of India, known as the Bench, has for the first time recognized marital rape for the purpose of unwanted pregnancy in accessing abortion. Though marital rape under the penal code is under challenge in the Supreme Court and is pending, the ruling with respect to abortion officially recognizes its existence in a legal framework. This could pave the way for the recognition of marital rape as a criminal offense. The bench has also allowed unmarried and single women whose pregnancies are between 20 and 24 weeks to access abortion. For the past 51 years, only married women were allowed this fundamental right. The court found that this discrepancy was violative of the right to equality before law and equal protection. Justice Chandrachud said of the judgment, the law should not decide the beneficiaries of a statute based on narrow patriarchal principles about what constitutes permissible sex. This would create invidious classifications. India, which has a crisis of unsafe abortions due to limitations on access, has now become a bit safer for poor families with fewer choices. A much appreciated step in the right direction. On the 2nd of October, Brazil's landless rural workers' movement, MST, made history by electing six candidates for state and federal office in the states of Pernambuco, Quiera Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, and two candidates in Rio Grande do Sul. This is the first time that the MST is running candidates, and since they struggle for the working class, this is a vital step in promoting a diverse slate with members of parliament that stand for the people and are committed to building a popular project for the nation. In the first round of the presidential election, former President Lula came out very strong with a 5% lead over Bolsonaro, but since he did not win over 50% of the vote, he will need to run against Bolsonaro again in a runoff on October 30th. The decision to launch new candidates came from the need for victory in this election. Pao Paulo, part of the campaign for Lula's presidency, stated, the great challenge now is to re-elect President Lula with a great voter turnout and to elect Haddad in Sao Paulo. Besides the candidacies we support in other states that are running in the second round for governor. As the runoff results will be announced around the time of this video airing, we are all hoping for some major PLN in Brazil. Hey, it's Tristan the editor here. Just want to give you a quick update to say that uh, Lula did win. Yay! In late September, youth from around the world participated in an international day of protest demanding climate reparations and justice. Occurring six weeks before the upcoming COP27 climate summit, demonstrators called for wealthy countries to pay reparations to poorer countries that have been the hardest hit by the disasters caused by global warming. They emphasized the increasing severity and frequency of climate catastrophes such as heat waves, floods, wildfires, and droughts that are devastating livelihoods and human life. Young people walked out of schools, colleges, and workplaces in 100 countries, and they're not just calling for liberal reforms. Fridays for Future, coordinator of the protests, said on its website, colonizers and capitalists are at the core of every system of oppression that has caused the climate crisis, and called for decolonization using the tool of climate reparations. They also demanded that indigenous, black, anti-patriarchal and diverse marginalized communities get their lands back, giving resources to communities most affected by the climate crisis, and that the richest capitalist 1% must be held responsible for their actions. Their profit is our death and suffering. Holy mother of beast. It looks like the kids are all right. On October 8th, after a full day of deliberations, a jury unanimously found two animal activists not guilty on all charges for rescuing two piglets from a massive pig farm in the Utah desert, a facility owned by Smithfield Foods. The activists documented the horrific conditions of the facility, which are truly too horrific for us to go into, using virtual reality technology, and they published their stream via the New York Times, allowing everyone to see the atrocities for themselves. Of the two piglets rescued, one had a severe leg injury, and the other was critically malnourished. During his closing remarks, one of the defendants, Wayne Hsun, urged the jury to do the right thing and help set a precedent of legalized animal rescue. If they did so, he argued, 
They would help create a world where animals are viewed as the sentient creatures they are, instead of being living commodities abused by unaccountable corporations. Even in a conservative state, the jury agreed. The acquittal of the activists sets a powerful precedent for the legal right to rescue animals from systemic industrial abuse. Thanks to legal protection, habitat restoration, and reintroduction, the wolf, brown bear, and white-tailed eagle populations are making a comeback across Europe. This shows just how effective pro-wildlife legislation can be in species recovery. Over centuries, great wolves were hunted to near extinction. Since legislation to protect them, their numbers have increased by 1,800%. White-tailed eagles, whose legal protections include the banning of harmful pesticides, have increased by 445%. Brown bears have increased by 44%. And while coexistence with these large predators presents challenges, we are learning ways to live alongside them. Of these efforts, Franz Schepper's executive director of Rewilding Europe said, by learning from the success stories, we can maximize wildlife comeback across the board. The report also shows that we must work hard on many fronts to keep the recovery happening and to allow more species to benefit from this. A newly proposed EU nature restoration law, if adopted, would advance efforts to improve biodiversity and mitigate climate breakdown. The proposal includes targets to reverse the decline of pollinator populations by 2030 and cut the use of harmful pesticides in half by the same date. PLN will keep an eye on the progress of this legislation. Comrades, if you have good news from the current month, please send your stories to totalliberationpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you to Javi for the positive news jams. Thank you to Cosmo for the positive news background. Thank you to Jacob, Catherine, Ash, Nick, and Mexi for script writing and production. And thank you to Tristan for editing this video. And to me, of course, for hosting this one. Please help us expand our team and our output by becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash positive leftist news. Or you can give us a one-time donation via Patreon. PayPal. The link is in the description box below. Solidarity and have a good day. See you soon. Peace. Yeah.